so far we have started into a survey of potential pathogens. We've looked at bacteria. We've looked at unicellular eukaryotes, the protista. We have looked at fungi and we've looked at multicellular animal parasites. We will get to the viruses, of course, and the prions, but before we do, I think it makes sense to take a look at some of the tools that we might use to look at all these different critters and non-critters. Recall that this course covers quite the scale of stuff. And most of the things we're talking about are things that we cannot see with the naked eye. So we need to use a compound light microscope, perhaps, like we use in the lab, or maybe a scanning or transmission electron microscope. And we're going to talk about how those different pieces of equipment function. Now we'll also touch very briefly on scanning transmission microscopes and also atom force microscopes. They're not that important for what we're doing in this course, but they're just too damn cool to ignore. We are rather biased when we experience the universe around us. So as humans, we appreciate things that happen on a human scale, things that are meters in size or maybe centimeters in size, those make sense to us. But if something is light years across or if something is a nanometer across, that's kind of hard to comprehend. In terms of time as well, things that happen in minutes or hours, we get that. But if we're talking about things that happen in a tiny fraction of a millisecond, like a chemical reaction, or if we're talking about things that take millions of years to occur, that's kind of difficult to wrap our head around as well. We have the same biases when we're looking at living things. So if you have good vision, you can see something down to about 40 micrometers. That's at the limits of what you can make out. You're gonna see that as a tiny little dot. Anything smaller than that? Well, it might as well not exist as far as you're concerned, unless you have a microscope of some sort. So we need a light microscope to see protozoa and fungi and bacteria that are microscopic, so below the limits of human visual perception. And we need an electron microscope to see most of the viruses and things that are smaller still. Of course, the basic concept with any microscope is that we're taking something small and we're forming an image that is larger. So with a compound light microscope, we have an illumination source so a light source, and that's going to shine light onto the specimen, and then a lens is going to take that light and form a larger image. And with a light microscope, the image is also going to be inverted. It's going to be turned upside down. We talked about the development of the microscope earlier in our introduction, where we talked about the history of microbiology. Remember that Van Leeuwenhoek gave us some of our first microscopes. He actually didn't invent the microscope, but he stumbled upon them and perfected them and tweaked them. And then Robert Hooke gave us some of our first compound microscopes. So the simple little microscope that Van Leeuwenhoek worked on had a single lens. The compound microscope has more than one lens. So the image can be magnified and reformed several times. And just as a very quick refresher, remember that Antony van Leeuwenhoek in the 1600s with these very simple little microscopes, it looks like a tiny little violin almost, but we have a tiny little lens there and this was able to magnify images 300 times. And he was the first person that we know of at least to see bacteria. I mean bacteria had been around for 3.8 billion years, and this dude was able to see them for the very first time. That's pretty cool. We use two different types of light microscopes in a biology lab, and the first one we'll talk about briefly is the dissecting light microscope. As the name suggests, you can work under this microscope. You can manipulate specimens and dissect them. So for instance, maybe you might dissect a large insect, or you might use these in a geology lab to look at minerals, for instance. We have a larger depth of field as well. 
And let me explain what I mean by that. So imagine on the stage, and I'll draw this up here, we have a specimen and it's a kind of chunky specimen. It's quite thick. Now, if we were to look at that specimen under the microscope, the depth of field refers to the vertical area that will be in focus. So with a dissecting scope, this peak up here might be in focus, but this down here will also be in focus. Now, if we were to use a compound light microscope, which is what we would use to look at a slide, to look at a very thin tissue section, for instance, on that kind of microscope, we have our slide and then we have a specimen on top of that. And this would be too thick to work well because the depth of focus would be much, much narrower. There's only gonna be a tiny little slice that's going to be in focus. So if we were to focus on this point down here, this point up here would be out of focus. It would be very, very blurry. We have lots of room under the lenses to manipulate the specimen. We also have a three-dimensional image being presented to your eye. So we have two eyepieces, as you can see. But what's interesting about these microscopes is that within this housing here, we actually have two adjacent objective lenses. We have one here and we have another one over here. You have to take one of these microscopes and kind of tip them upside down to see those two separate lenses. But what this does is it gives us two slightly different views of the object that's on the stage. And that allows us to get a binocular view of that object and to get a three-dimensional image. Also within a dissecting scope, the image is not inverted. It's not flipped around or upside down. And that makes sense because if that wasn't the case, it would be very, very difficult to manipulate an object under the microscope. You couldn't dissect if you're looking through the lenses and all the motions you make are backwards. That would be really tricky. Now the drawback of this microscope is that it doesn't magnify very much. So it's not something that would be particularly useful in a microbiology laboratory. We can't use it to see bacteria, for instance, but we might use it to look at bacteria colonies on a plate. Compound light microscopes are generally much more useful in a microbiology laboratory. We have several lenses. And let's take a look at the path that the light takes as it passes through the specimen to get to your eye. So we have an illuminator or light source at the bottom. We have a condenser lens that is going to focus light onto the specimen and the specimen will sit on the stage. The light is then going to pass through our objective lenses. Within the tube of the objective lens, we may have several separate lenses. The light is then going to be redirected by a prism and it's going to be passed through the ocular lens and then onto your eye. The image is going to be magnified within the objective lenses and then magnified again within the ocular lens. The image is also going to be inverted. It's going to be flipped around. And if you're new to working with a compound light microscope, that might take a bit of getting used to. When light moves from one medium to another, it changes velocity. And if it hits the interface between those two media at an oblique angle, it changes direction. We call that refraction. We've got two light beams traveling up through a condenser lens, through a slide, and then into an objective lens in this diagram. On the left, you're seeing what happens when we're not using immersion oil. So that red beam, you can see that it refracts quite a lot when it goes from the glass slide to the air. It changes direction. So we have a lot of light that's not going to make it into the objective lens. On the right, the blue ray is passing from the glass 
to immersion oil. Immersion oil has a very similar refractive index to glass. What that means is the density of the two is quite similar and we don't have redirection of that light. We don't have refraction of that light. So that blue beam represents what happens when we go from one medium to a similar medium. The light is going to keep traveling in a straight line. It's going to go through the immersion oil and back into the glass of the oil immersion objective lens without being redirected uh, crazily off to the side and missing the lens altogether. When we're using a high power objective, the 100x objective, for instance, on our microscopes, we use a droplet of immersion oil between the glass slide and between the glass of the objective lens. And that ensures that we can collect as much light as possible. If we don't use the immersion oil on the highest magnification objective lenses, we get a very dim image because we're losing a lot of light and we get poor resolution as well. So with our microscopes and the majority of commonly used light microscopes in laboratories, we can get a magnification of up to a thousand times and still have decent resolution. But at those higher magnifications, we need to use immersion oil so that we don't lose a lot of light to refraction. So what is resolution? Well, it's the ability to distinguish two adjacent points as distinct entities. On the right, you're seeing a microscope with decent resolution. It can distinguish two points that are as close as 0.2 micrometers. So we can have two individual points that are that close together and we can still see them as separate things. On the left, we have a microscope with much poorer resolution. In this case, we can only see points as separate entities if they are at least two micrometers apart. So you can see we get a much blurrier image. So resolution is the ability to distinguish two adjacent points as distinct objects. You could walk into a toy store and you could probably find a microscope for under $100 that claims to magnify more than 2,000 times. The problem is, it's going to make objects look bigger, but what you're going to see is a great big blurry blob. A very, very cheap microscope will have very poor resolution. And that's because of the lens quality. So if you want to magnify something a thousand times, but at the same time retain a clear, crisp image, you want to retain that detail, you need very, very high quality lenses. Another way to increase the resolution that a microscope is capable of is to reduce the wavelength of the light that you're using. So for instance, you could come up with a microscope that used ultraviolet light. Ultraviolet light has a shorter wavelength than visible light, you would get higher resolution. And in fact, such microscopes do exist. They're rather expensive. And also the problem that they have is that humans can't see UV light. So instead of being able to look through them, you need to have them hooked up to some sort of digital sensor. The smaller the resolution value, and by that I mean the distance between two points that can be distinguished as separate points, the better the microscope. Resolution determines the level of detail that we'll be able to see. Contrast determines whether or not we'll be able to see anything at all. So there needs to be contrast between the object we're looking at and its surroundings. To improve contrast, we use stain. So at the top here, what you're seeing is a human cheek cell. So you can isolate these cells very easily. You just take a cotton swab, rub it around the inside of your mouth, put that into a drop of water. And that's what you'll see at the top if you don't add any stain. You can see we have a nucleus and you can make out some of the details, but it's kind of hard to see. 
And in fact, if you're presented with a situation like this, you probably won't see anything unless you lower the condenser to generate some shadows on the slide. But if you want to see stuff, what you can do is you can stain the cells. You can use charged dyed molecules, colorful molecules, pigments that will stick to the cell and make it look different from its surroundings. And that's what you're seeing at the bottom. So now the nucleus really pops. You can see it really well. And of course, we can see the proteins that are associated with the plasma membrane. Here we have a really dramatic example of the efficacy of a stain. On the left, you're seeing bacteria, except that you're not seeing them. And that's because bacteria, like other cells, are translucent. Light shines through them. And they're very small cells as well. On the right, you're seeing the same sample of bacterial cells, but this time they've been stained. We've used a simple stain. A simple stain is not selective or differential. It sticks to the cell. It doesn't select particular molecules necessarily, but it just allows us to see the cell. The cell sticks out from its surroundings. And of course, even though we're at the same magnification, we're looking at the same sample, we can see something now. We can see the bacteria cells. Before we stain cells, we typically fix them. And that refers to the act of chemically binding or cross-linking molecules together. So for instance, if we were to preserve something for dissection, let's say we're going to preserve a fetal pig, what we might do is treat the tissue with an aldehyde of some sort, glutaraldehyde or formaldehyde. And what that's going to do is it's going to cause the proteins to link together. They're going to form covalent bonds and link together. And that changes the properties of the tissue. It makes it kind of tough. It makes it difficult for bacteria to break down. And that's going to preserve the tissue so that bacteria can't destroy it. They can't cause it to rot and decay. We do the same thing with cells. We apply a chemical treatment or sometimes a heat treatment that is going to stick the cells together if we're looking at tissues or it's going to link the proteins in the tissue together as well. And we have to be careful because it will probably change the appearance and the properties of the cell. Now, what if we want to study a living cell to study the function of the cell? Well, we can still use stains, but we have to use something called a vital stain. Vitality refers to life. So these are stains that don't kill the cell, and we're not going to fix the cell either. Unfortunately, these stains tend not to work nearly as well, and they do tend to kill the cell eventually. Why staining works is that stain molecules, they're pigments, they absorb certain wavelengths of light and that results in the color that we see, but also stains are charged molecules and they will stick to molecules that have an opposite charge. So for instance, DNA has a slightly negative charge that's the result of the phosphates that are exposed on the backbone of the DNA molecule. If we use a positive stain, there's a good chance that it will stick to the DNA and help us identify the nucleus, for instance. Now, another thing we can use is something called a mordant. And a mordant will help fix or stick the stain to the specimen. It's kind of a go-between. So it sticks to the stain and then it sticks to the specimen. Or, as I mentioned previously, we can use a mordant to coat a structure that's very thin, like the flagellum of a cell, and make it more noticeable, make it visible under the microscope. Under a light microscope, the flagella of bacteria are normally far too thin to see. What's been done here is we've used a special mixture of stain and mordant that will stick to the flagella in many, many coats, making them much thicker. So we're not just coloring them, we're making them thicker so that they become visible. A very well-known staining technique that we touched on when we talked about the bacteria is gram staining. And this was brought to us by this 
unassuming fellow here, Hans Christian Graham. This is something that's still very, very important. It's something that has been used for well over 100 years and continues to be used in modern microbiology laboratories. This staining technique is pretty straightforward. It's really simple. You will have a chance to do this in the lab and see for yourself. And it very quickly distinguishes between two major groups of bacteria. It will tell us whether those bacteria have a cell wall that contains a very thick layer of peptidoglycan or whether they have a cell wall that contains a thin layer of peptidoglycan sandwiched between two lipid bilayers. As we learned previously, in gram-positive cells, we have this very, very thick layer of peptidoglycan. Remember, peptidoglycan is a mixture of sugar and protein, and this thick layer is going to be anchored to the plasma membrane, whereas in gram-negative cells, we have an outer membrane in addition to the plasma membrane. We have a periplasmic space between the two membranes, and we have a thin layer of peptidoglycan that resides within that paraplasmic space. So how do we go about gram staining? Well, the first thing we wanna do is make the cells stick to the slide. We say that we fix them to the slide. We'll take a very, very thin layer of bacteria culture, put it onto the slide, let it dry out, and then heat it gently over a Bunsen burner. And what that does is it denatures some of the proteins on the outside of the cell wall and they become kind of sticky and this sticks the cells to the slide so that we don't lose them as we go through this procedure. Now, if we were to look at our cells under the microscope at this point, we really wouldn't see much of anything. If you have a ton of bacteria cells, then you might see a hint of color, for instance, Staphylococcus aureus looks golden on a Petri plate. But if you have a thin layer of cells on a slide, you can't see them at all if they're not stained. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to add crystal violet. This is our primary stain. It's a very dark purple or dark blue, and it sticks to peptidoglycan. If we were to add some of this to our cells and wash off the excess and look at it under the microscope, all of our cells would appear purple. So whether they were gram positive or gram negative, they would retain a little bit of that dye. The next thing we're going to do after we rinse the excess dye away is we're going to add a mordant, and the mordant is iodine. Iodine will combine with the crystal violet and form crystal violet iodine crystals and these crystals are larger and they stick to the peptidoglycan a bit better. They're less likely to be removed during our next step. And at this point, if we looked at our cells under the microscope, again, whether they were gram positive or gram negative, they would appear purple in color. The next step is the important one and the tricky one. We're going to use a decolorizing agent. This is alcohol acetone. And what it's going to do is it's going to strip away those crystal violet iodine crystals. If we did this for too long, it would strip away all the color from the gram positive and the gram negative cells, but we're not going to do it for too long. We're only going to do it for about 15 to 20 seconds. That's enough time to strip away all of the dye from the gram-negative cells. Remember, gram-negative cells have an outer membrane, so not very much of that crystal violet was able to make it through that membrane to get to the peptidoglycan. And even if it did, there's not very much peptidoglycan for it to bind to. Gram-positive cells, on the other hand, have a lot of peptidoglycan, and it's exposed at the surface. It's not protected by an outer membrane. So after this decolorization uh, procedure, we still have a lot of this crystal violet dye attached to the gram positive cells. Now, the other thing that's kind of interesting is this alcohol acetone will strip away the outer membrane from the gram negative cells. So any of the dye that just happened to be stuck to proteins on the outside of that membrane 
will be removed with the outer membrane. Now at this point, if we looked at it under a microscope, we would not be able to see the gram negative cells. They have not been stained at all. So we have to add a second stain, a counter stain, that will allow us to see the gram negative cells. This stain will enter into the cells and stain the interior pink. It will also bind to the gram positive cells, but that crystal violet is very, very dark. It's a very intense purple blue color and it overpowers that pink safranin. So after we're all done, we have gram-positive cells that will appear purple or blue, and we have gram-negative cells that will appear pink. And here's some examples. So we have gram-positive cells that are gonna be purple or blue in color, and we have gram-negative cells that will be pink in color. Mycobacteria cells can't be stained using gram staining, and that's because they have a layer of mycolic acid the mycolic acid is waxy or hydrophobic. It repels dyes. And the dyes can't get past that layer. They can't get into the cell. So if we want to identify these cells, we have to do something a little bit different. Instead, we have to use something called acid fast staining. So what we do is we heat up the cells and we expose them to a concentrated dye. Now, when you heat something up, you cause a random motion. Remember, that's what heat is. It's the random motion of molecules. And that increases the fluidity of the cell wall and the cell membrane. So basically, little holes, little pockets are going to form within the wall. And that's going to allow the dye to sneak past the mycolic acid into the cell. Next, we're going to cool down the cells and that mycolic acid layer will reseal and that will seal the dye into the cell. We're going to then expose the bacteria to this acidic solution that in any other bacterium would very effectively decolorize the cell. It would bring all the dye out of the cell, but the mycolic acid in this case is going to lock the color into the interior of the bacteria. So the name, of course, acid refers to the fact that we're going to use an acidic uh, solution to try to decolorize the cells. The fastness refers to the fact that the stain is locked fastly within the cell. So let's take a look at what this procedure looks like. And this is something you're going to attempt in the lab. So we start off with cells that aren't dyed. They don't have any contrast. If we looked at them under the microscope, we really wouldn't see much of anything. But we're going to heat up these cells in a steam bath, and we're going to add carbyl fuchsin. This is our primary stain, and the heat is going to cause the mycolic acid layer to become very fluid so that that dye can enter into the cells. It'll enter into non-acid fast cells as well quite easily. And if we were to rinse off the slide and take a look at those cells under the microscope at this point, we would see that both the acid fast cells and the non-acid fast cells are red or pink in color. The next thing we're going to do is allow the cells to cool down, and if there's a mycolic acid layer present, it's going to essentially reseal. And then we're going to add our decolorizing agent, which is an acid alcohol. Now in all non-acid fast cells, this is a very powerful solution. It's going to solubilize the dye and allow it to be drawn out of the cells. With the mycolic acid layer, though, it's not going to be able to penetrate the cells. That mycolic acid layer is going to lock the color in to the interior of the acid fast cells. So after this decolorizing step, the acid fast cells will still appear red or pink, and the non-acid fast cells will appear clear.
Now, once again, we have the problem where we've got cells that we can't see, they're not stained. So we need a counter stain and that counter stain is methylene blue and that'll be taken up by the non-acid fast cells and it will dye them light blue so that we can actually see them. The acid fast cells will still be this strong red or pink color. To recap, we're gonna use heat to drive in our primary stain, the carbofuxin. We're then going to rinse the cells, allow them to cool, and we're going to decolorize them with this acid alcohol. The carbofuxin is gonna be locked in to our acid fast cells. This acid alcohol is not going to be able to remove it. Next, we're going to counter stain our cells with methylene blue, which will stain the non-acid fast cells so that we can see them. And here is what the end result might look like. Let's say you've got a patient with a bad cough. You could have them cough up some material, some sputum, and then make a slide from that. So you would take that material, you'd put it on a slide, you would fix it to the slide, and then you'd go through the acid fast staining technique. The large blue cells here that have been stained by methylene blue are epithelial cells. So cells that have been lost from the lining of the lungs. The much smaller cells that are pink in color are mycobacterium tuberculosis, which is the mycobacterium that causes tuberculosis. We can also use heating to drive a stain into endospores. This is a very similar technique to acid fast staining, but we're using a dye known as malachite green, and we're heating up these cells that again is going to make the very, very tough wall of the endospore a bit more fluid that allows us to dry in a stain. We cool the cells and then that stain can't be removed by a decolorizing agent. So what you're seeing here is the identification of endospores within a gram positive bacteria. Capsules are also structures that stains tend to have a hard time sticking to. What you're seeing here is something called a negative staining or capsule staining, where what they've done is they've stained the background of the cell. So they've used a stain that will penetrate into the cell and stain the interior of the bacterium. And then they've used a stain that will stick to the slide itself and it doesn't stick to the capsule. So this clear area around the bacterium tells us that we have this thick capsule. As we talked about before, that's a rather important discovery because that tells us that these bacteria may be able to resist our immune system. It's quite possible that a bacterium with a capsule like this might not be able to be destroyed by white blood cells. And here's another example of the same thing. So again, the brown is the staining of the slide itself and the clear area around the bacteria cells is the capsule. The capsule did not bind to any of that stain. If you want a differential stain that will identify very specific components of a cell, antibodies are the way to go. So antibodies can be generated in a rabbit or a lab rat, and these antibodies will recognize very specific antigens. An antigen is a protein, and the antibodies will stick to very specific shapes on specific proteins. Now, the neat thing about this is you can take the antibodies and you can stick dyes to them. Quite often the dyes are fluorescent, which means that they light up, they glow if you expose them to UV light. So now what you can do is you can take your labeled antibody, and by labeled I mean it has a dye attached to it, and you can add that to cells on a slide, and you can see where they stick. So you add some of your antibody, you wash off the excess that's not stuck, and then you look to see where that fluorescent dye is located. So now what you've done is you've located the exact location of a specific protein. So a fluorescent dye 
is going to give off a visible wavelength of light when it's exposed to UV light, when it's exposed to a black light, basically. So if you go into a nightclub or something like that, they'll have UV lights up on the ceiling. Or if you go into, let's say, uh, a bowling alley, those are always fun. You wear those funky bowling shoes and the UV light is going to bounce off the laces on those shoes and cause them to light up and give off a wavelength of light that you can see. It's a similar idea here. So we have some antibodies that might be bound to a particular dye that will give off a red color when exposed to UV. We have other antibodies that might be bound to another dye molecule that will give off a green color when they're exposed to UV. We can use several of these different antibody dye combinations on the same specimen. So we can have an antibody that binds to a protein that's found within the plasma membrane and it gives off a green color. And then we can have another dye that's bound to an antibody that recognizes a protein in the nuclear lamina. Maybe it gives off a blue color, etc. We can combine this fluorescence with something known as confocal microscopy. A confocal microscope is a microscope that uses lasers to produce an image. Laser stands for light amplification through stimulated emission of radiation. And do you need to know that? Well, no, absolutely not. But the important properties of a laser are that the color is very specific. Laser light contains a very specific wavelength of light. It's not a mixture of different colors. And we can use it to excite very specific dyes and not other dyes. But also, a laser contains light rays that are almost completely parallel. They're not divergent in any way. And that's why you can take a laser and you can shine it across a lake whereas you can't do that with a flashlight, the light rays are going to diverge. Anyway, the fact that the light rays are all parallel allows us to get rather high resolution, rather clear images. It also allows this microscope to focus in on very specific planes. And you can see that at the bottom here, we have these very precise focal planes. Now remember, we talked about CAT scans before, and with a CAT scan, what you do is you take a number of kind of slices through an object, like a skull, using x-rays, and the x-rays are focused in on a very specific plane, and you can take a whole bunch of those images, combine them all together, and make a three-dimensional image of the skull. Well, you can do the same thing with a confocal microscope. You can zoom in on very, very precise focal planes. You can add them all together and you can generate a three-dimensional image of the object that you're looking at. So let's take a look at an example of this. What we're looking at here is just fluorescence microscopy, not confocal microscopy. But imagine that we have a microscope that produces visible light that will pass through a specimen. And of course, we can see that visible light, but it also produces a small amount of ultraviolet light. That ultraviolet light, if it hits a fluorescent dye, will cause it to light up and give off a visible color, in this case, green, that we can also see. So we've got an image on the left here that shows just some mucus and some debris that someone has coughed up as sputum. You can't see a whole lot of stuff going on there. But imagine if we add an antibody that will bind to mycolic acid or bind to another protein that's specific to mycobacteria. And what we do is we take that antibody with the bind dye and we let it sit on that slide for a little bit and then we wash off the excess to get rid of anything that hasn't bound. We look at that under the microscope and this particular dye that's bound to that antibody will light up green. And now we've identified these mycobacteria cells that we can't even make out on that original image. Now let's take a look at what the confocal microscope can do with this fluorescent stuff. 
So what you've got on the left here is a situation where we have three different antibodies that are bound to three different fluorescent dyes that can recognize three different proteins. And these different proteins make up different parts of the cytoskeleton of a cell. So you can see that we have green and yellow and red and they're recognizing different proteins. They're telling us about the structure of the cell. But notice with the traditional fluorescence, so this would be a traditional light microscope that also produces a bit of UV, things are a bit fuzzy. We don't see a whole lot of detail. Now compare that to the confocal microscope. What this microscope is doing is it's using lasers that are very precise, they're very focused, and it's focusing in on very, very narrow depths of field. It's generating an image, and then it's going down a little bit more, generating another image, etc. It's taking all those images and compiling them together to give us this nice, crisp, clear image. This is something that actually requires quite a bit of uh, computer manipulation in order for this to work.
one of the major players in the early development of the electron microscope was the University of Toronto. And you're seeing one of their early electron microscopes in this photograph. We would have electrons being forced into a tungsten wire at the top of this machine, and that would liberate electrons that would flow down to the bottom and through a specimen. The fundamental structure of an electron microscope hasn't changed very much. So we have what's called an electron gun at the top, and the electron gun contains a tungsten filament similar to what you would see in an old school incandescent light bulb. We pass a high voltage through this, so we pass a lot of electrons through this wire, and some of those electrons will be liberated, they'll be given off, and they can be used to generate a high energy electron beam. Now electrons have mass, they can't pass through glass the way that photons of light can. So we can't use glass lenses to focus this beam. Instead, we have to use electromagnets. Notice that we have a condenser lens and we have an objective lens. These are lenses that focus the beam, but they're electromagnets. Now, in this particular case, we're looking at a transmission electron microscope, which means that the electrons are transmitted through the specimen. So the electron beam is gonna pass down to the specimen and the specimen is going to be a very, very thin sample of tissue or cells that's being stained with heavy metals. If the electrons hit part of that stain, they're gonna be blocked and that's gonna create a shadow at the bottom of the machine. But if the electrons can get through, they'll hit a fluorescent screen and they'll cause that little pixel of the screen to light up. The older electron microscopes will have a little window that you look through and you can see this image on the bottom. And they'll also have a camera that you can use to take a picture of that image. And in the newer electron microscopes, of course, there's going to be a digital sensor at the bottom of that machine. Well, some labs were working on this in a purely academic sense to develop a machine that could allow us to peer into the tiniest bits of the universe. Other institutions realized that there was some serious money to be made from this technology. They realized that if you could take this electron beam and wiggle it back and forth across a fluorescent screen, maybe you could form some interesting images. And the first TVs, and I'm kind of old because this is what I think of when I think of a TV, were the CRT, cathode ray tube TVs, that utilized this technology. So you're seeing an old school TV on the left here, and the screen that you would look at is a fluorescent screen. Basically, it contains these fluorescent components that can be excited if they absorb an electron. What you're seeing on the right here is the back of this TV. So we've removed everything so we can see the guts. And we have an electron gun here that is going to produce electrons. The electrons are going this way. They're going to pass through these copper coils so an electromagnet, and then the beam can be directed back and forth across the screen to form a moving image. And we owe television to the development of the electron microscope. Here's a scanning electron microscope. Instead of passing electrons through a specimen, it bounces them off of the surface and the beam scans back and forth. So what we do is we take a specimen like this bed bug here, and we cover it in heavy metals. We focus a beam of electrons onto it. The electrons will bounce off of that heavy metal coating, or they might liberate electrons from those heavy metal atoms, and those electrons are detected and absorbed by sensors that are around the chamber containing this specimen.
In many ways, this is quite similar to a dissecting light microscope. The dissecting light microscope is going to bounce light off of the surface to form a 3D image. In this case, we're bouncing electrons off of the surface of the specimen to form a 3D image. For instance, here we're seeing E. coli using a scanning electron microscope, and we're seeing the surface of the E. coli. In fact, you can see some E. coli here that are in the process of binary fission. You can see them dividing here, but we're just looking at the surface of these cells. To prepare specimens for the scanning electron microscope, we have to coat them in heavy metal typically platinum or gold. So these are large atoms. When the electron beam hits those atoms, the electrons will bounce off or the electrons will liberate additional electrons from those big atoms. The electrons are gonna be scattered. They're going to be detected by sensors that are all around the specimen. To coat your specimen, you use something called a sputter coater which is what you're seeing on the left. So you take your specimen, such as this B here, and you put it into the chamber, and then you add a tiny amount of gold or platinum at the top. A large amount of electricity is passed through that material. It instantly vaporizes it and atomizes it and coats the specimen with it and you can get some remarkable 3D images of the surfaces of different organisms using this technique. So here we're seeing the face of a mosquito. On the left, we're seeing it face on, and on the right, we're seeing a side view. You can even see things that are quite a bit smaller, but again, we're looking at the surfaces. So we have Giardia on the left, and we have a T4 bacteriophage on the right. This is a virus that infects bacteria. And a couple more scary things here to look at. On the left, we have the face of a hookworm, and you can see these teeth-like structures that it's going to use to grab onto the lining of your intestine, make it bleed so it has something to eat. On the right, we have a tapeworm, and we've got these suction cups that it's going to use to attach itself to your intestinal lining. Remember that tapeworms, though, don't draw blood. Instead, they're just going to use those suckers to stay put, and then they're going to feed on the pre-digested food that's found within the intestine. And one last scanning electron image. We've got a happy little tick here. That structure in the middle down the bottom there that looks like a beak is actually kind of a beak. So we've got these teeth-like structures at the bottom that it's going to use like a serrated knife to cut into your skin and feed on your blood. The transmission electron microscope, or TEM, gives us much higher magnifications than we can get with the scanning electron microscope. It passes electrons through the specimen, and the specimen has to be very, very thin. So this is similar to the compound light microscope. In the compound light microscope, light passes through the specimen. The specimens need to be remarkably thin, quite a bit thinner than they would need to be for a compound light microscope. Typically what you would do is you would take a piece of tissue, muscle tissue for instance, and you would embed that within plastic or epoxy, cut extremely thin sections and then stain them with heavy metals. So the stains do the same thing that they would do for the compound light microscope. They provide contrast. Imagine that we have a heavy metal stain that will stick to the nucleus and maybe the mitochondria. If we pass an electron beam through the stained section, the electrons are gonna be absorbed by those heavy metals and that will create a shadow on the fluorescent screen at the bottom of the machine. The electron microscope that you're seeing here is very old. It's very outdated. It's the kind of thing you might be able to buy on eBay. That would be pretty cool. I wanna have one of these things in my basement. Oh well, I can dream. But anyway, 
it's a nice example of an early transmission electron microscope because it shows how these things work. The basic mechanics have not changed. At the top, we have an electron gun. So up here, we have a source of electrons. The electrons are going to come down this tube and they're going to be focused by a condenser lens onto the specimen. And the specimen is going to be contained within this area. The electrons are going to pass through the specimen. They're going to go through an objective lens and they're going to come down and they're going to hit a fluorescent screen down the bottom here. And you can see that this woman can look into that fluorescent screen and see what's going on. She can see that image down the bottom. Um, she can zoom in on it a bit by looking through these ocular lenses as well. Again, we wouldn't probably have a window like that on a modern transmission electron microscope. Instead, it would just be hooked up to a computer uh, and that's how we would get our imagery. To recap, let's again look at the parts of the transmission electron microscope. And again, an ancient example here, but it's easier to see all the bits and pieces. At the top, we have our electron source. So we have a tungsten filament that is going to liberate a whole bunch of high energy electrons. The electrons are traveling down through a condenser coil, a condenser lens, an electromagnet that's going to focus the beam onto our sample. The electrons will pass through the sample. They're going to be focused again, and that image is going to be magnified by the objective coil. And the electron beam will be focused onto a fluorescent screen or some sort of sensor at the bottom of the microscope. Now, one thing I haven't mentioned so far is that the interior of the microscope needs to be a vacuum. So we have this beam of electrons coming down. And of course, if the electrons hit air molecules, they hit an oxygen molecule or a nitrogen molecule, they're going to bounce off of that molecule. They're going to be deflected and we can't have that happen. So you can see that this is one limitation of electron microscopes. We can't look at living cells for two reasons. First of all, things that we put in here typically need to be covered in heavy metal or stained with heavy metal if we're talking about a TEM like this. And also those things need to be in a complete vacuum. These are things that cells do not enjoy. They also do not enjoy being bombarded with high energy beams of electrons. So we can't look at living processes using the electron microscope. And I'll just point out that these microscopes can be awesomely large. Here is one made by Hitachi. And this one's actually about 20 years old or more. But you can see down the bottom here, we have a scientist for scale. I mean, this thing is massive. So these microscopes can actually be used to look at molecules and look at atoms. Here are some examples of what you might see with a transmission electron microscope. These microscopes are capable of very, very high magnification. When we're looking at a photograph, quote unquote, that's produced by an electron microscope, we refer to it as a micrograph. And they are in black and white. However, you will see a lot that are very pretty colors, but uh, those are artificial colors that are added to make the pictures look a bit prettier. What you're seeing here is a section, so a transverse section through an E. coli cell, and you can see that it's got a little internal parasite. There's another bacterium that's living inside of it. The magnification that you see at the top, of course, if you're paying attention, might not be correct because it depends on the size of the screen that you're viewing this on. Here's a diagram of a typical bacterium, and here's what it looks like under the electron microscope. So the TEM is used to study the internal structures of cells and tissues in much the same way that we use the compound light microscope. The big difference, of course, is that we can see things that are much, much smaller with the TEM. It has a much higher 
higher resolution than the compound light microscope. We can even use the TEM to look at viruses, and we'll be looking at a lot of these micrographs. Again, the colors here are just for show. They're false colors. They look pretty. Uh, when we're looking at electron micrographs, we only see shadows. So we see dark and light. Let's have a look at E. coli under a few different microscopes. You'll be looking at E. coli in the lab using the compound light microscope, and you'll see this. So we're seeing a bacillus or rod-shaped bacterium that is gram negative. This is the result of a gram staining. Not a whole lot of detail, really. If we looked at E. coli under the scanning electron microscope, looking at the surface of the cell, we would see something like this. And if we looked at it under the transmission electron microscope, we would see something like this, and we would see a lot more detail. We can pick out the cell wall, for instance. We can see individual ribosomes. Let's compare the two main categories of microscopes. With a light microscope, we are, of course, using light to form an image, and the light is going to be redirected by lenses that are made typically of glass or perhaps plastic or quartz. We can view the image directly with the eye, but we can also use a camera. Um, in terms of color, yes, we can see colors under the light microscope. The specimens can be dead or alive, and this is a big benefit of the compound light microscope. Even though it can't resolve things anywhere near as small as the electron microscope can, we can see things that are living. We can watch them do stuff. We can observe their function. The techniques that we talked about and techniques that we will uh, touch on again in the lab include oil immersion, staining, fluorescence, and we talked about confocal microscopy as well. Light microscopy is reasonably cheap. So as microscopes go, light microscopes are far cheaper than electron microscopes. The magnification tends to be up to about a thousand times. For the electron microscope, we are of course using electrons to form an image, and the electrons are going to be redirected using magnetic fields. So we have electromagnets that serve as lenses. To view the results of this, we can look at a fluorescent screen, but more commonly, we're gonna use a camera or some sort of sensor that gives us an image on a computer screen. We don't see any color with an electron micrograph. When you look in your textbook, you'll see all these pretty images, but the colors are entirely made up. The cells that we look at and the tissues we look at have to be dead because, of course, they're being bombarded with high energy beams of electrons. They're in a vacuum and they're stained or uh, covered with heavy metals. The two different types of electron microscopes that we talked about are the scanning electron microscope, which looks at the surface of cells and tissues and organisms, and the transmission electron microscope, which passes electrons through the specimen. Electron microscopes are very expensive and they require quite a bit of training. They're also very heavy, actually. And finally, in terms of magnification, the scanning electron microscope can magnify up to 250,000 times. And the transmission electron microscope can magnify over a million times. And there are other electron microscopes that can do even better. I mentioned at the beginning that I would talk briefly about scanning tunneling microscopes and atomic force microscopes. I'm going to spend about a minute on that now. And no, you don't need to know this stuff, but it's pretty darn cool. So there are microscopes that we can use to view individual atoms. And even more crazily, we can use beams of electrons to manipulate and move individual atoms. And that's because, of course, electrons have a negative charge. So we can use them to push atoms around. 
And that's what you're seeing here. This is something that IBM has been working on for a long time. In fact, it goes back to the 80s. Uh, they've been able to take atoms like xenon atoms and use them to spell out their name and do all sorts of other cool things. They've actually made a stop motion film called A Boy and His Atom. Take a moment and look it up on YouTube. What they did was they took individual atoms and arranged them frame by frame and made a little stop motion movie. Now, why is this important? Well, probably after we're dead and gone, we'll be using this technology to put atoms end to end to build tiny, tiny little circuits. So if you think computers are powerful and tiny now, just wait until this stuff catches on. So to sum up, microscopes are probably the most important tools in microbiology. I mean, these were the things that allowed us to see microbes. Prior to that, people that uh, made claims of tiny little invisible things that cause us harm were probably seen as kind of crazy. Electron microscopes are capable of better resolution and thus can give us much higher magnification. So you should be able to appreciate what resolution refers to. Every type of microscope that we talked about has its advantages and disadvantages. You should know what those are and you should be able to compare the different microscopes and tell me what they might be used for. That might make a good question on a test. Staining increases the contrast of a specimen. Differential stain is going to bind to very specific structures, especially if we're talking about antibodies that are bound to a stain, then we can get very specific. And these differential stains can be very useful when it comes to identifying different species. And here's a short little terminology list for you. And here are a few study questions to share with your family and closest friends. I have no idea why I've started saying that, but it amuses me for some reason, probably because I'm spending all my time sitting in a dark room talking to myself. And finally, a little table that you can fill in that might be helpful.